it's so nice to be here. And Roger said, Do you want to do the welcome? I was like, Yes, <laughs> take the mask off. <laughs> um, so, welcome. Um, first church for a long time. Good to be here, good to gather, good to, to um, just like be still and um, welcome God's presence into our lives, into our time, into our day, and into our um, where we're at, you know, where we're at as a uh, in the world and uh, as a nation and as, as you know, just. So I'm going to pray and then probably hand over to Raj. Um, but uh, Mandy, hand over to Mandy. It's so nice to be here. Lord, I just thank you that um, we can meet again and, um, and we can uh, settle ourselves and come before you with gladness in our hearts and we can just. Um, meet and worship you and and be still before you and and look to you at this time and um, we, we dedicate this day to you and we dedicate our lives to you and uh, we just welcome you here Holy Spirit we need you we need you Lord I need you Lord and um, we want to offer our praise and offer wherever we're at to you because you um, you love it when we're just honest with you and you love it when we just come and we're just real before you so um, here we are Lord here we are to worship here we are to lift up your name here we are to say we're proud to be followers of you and and uh, we're gathered in your name so uh, Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. You can stand if you want to. If you don't, it's fine. Shine, 
I am. Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, whatever you bind on earth, will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Uh, and the passage is famous for being this moment when Peter proclaims who Jesus was. And it wasn't the first time that those titles had, had been used by Jesus' Jesus's disciples, and yet here, at least for Peter, it's this moment of absolute clarity and true faith. And even Jesus appears a little bit taken aback and he's like, whoa, this was not revealed to you, Peter, by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And it was a revelatory moment that Peter had. And it was a moment that all of Jesus' disciples would have to have at some point as they walked with Jesus. And for some of them, for some of them, it happened straight away. Like Nathaniel, think about Nathaniel, he was sitting under the fig tree. Jesus comes up and he says, something or other, I saw you under the fig tree. And Nathaniel instantly says, you are the king of Israel. You are the son of God. Whilst for other disciples, others of the disciples, like Thomas, he didn't get it until the resurrection. When he saw the wounds that Jesus bore and put his fingers into the wounds, it was only then that he fell down and said, My Lord and my God. And yet for here, here for Peter, it was at Caesarea Philippi, his moment of faith. And it's a moment, of course, we must all reach. Each one of us. A moment when we suddenly understand who Jesus really is. Who he really is. He's the Messiah. He's the Son of God. And we can all tell a story perhaps of the moment when that happened to us. That wonderful moment when we realise that Jesus wasn't just another prophet or teacher. He wasn't just a good man. He was God incarnate. The living God in human flesh. Walking upon the earth. The promised saviour of the world. And it's in that moment of believing that our lives are changed. Quite literally forever. And it's this intensely personal moment, isn't it? It happened to me. I realised God loves me. Yeah. He loves me. He died for me. He's, he's risen again for me. He's coming again for me, for Roger Wyatt. It's like intensely personal for each of us. But look at this passage. Something else happens in this short interchange. And it's almost hidden away in this spectacular moment of Peter's confession. Jesus speaks about something completely new and unexpected. And there's no evidence that he'd spoken about it. He might have done, but there's no, certainly in the Bible, this is the first time Jesus speaks about this thing. He introduces this concept for the very first time. What is it? Give me a muffled answer. The church. The church. I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. I will build my church. And it's probably the case that Peter didn't have a clue, and the disciples didn't have a clue what Jesus was actually talking about. And people sort of argue about what the rock means whether it was Peter the person or the revelation of the Son that Peter confessed, but the focus of the sentence really falls on this word, church. I used to think it was the most boring word in the whole world, honestly. Like, 
church just sounded so boring. Uh, and it's this word ecclesia. You know this, don't you? In the New Testament, it's the word ecclesia. And we can spend a long time talking about what this word actually means. Don't worry, we're not going to. People have tried to understand it as assembly, a gathering, a congregation, or even a synagogue. But let me just suggest to you that all of these things at best foreshadow what Ecclesia really means. Because it was something completely new. It was something completely unexpected. Am I too noisy? It happens sometimes. I get excited. In fact, in Ephesians 3, Paul calls the church a mystery. It's a mystery. Nobody saw this coming. Nobody anticipated the church. In fact, if you look hard enough in books like Isaiah, you can get little hints. It's there, but it's very hidden away. And, and going back to the passage and Peter's confession, what you can see, what Jesus does in this passage is really neat. Because after declaring that Peter is blessed, he takes focus away from Peter, the individual, and he places it on the many, this new thing, this ecclesia. And this is one of the most central realities of what it means to be a Christian. It's both intensely personal, incredibly personal, but it's also intensely communal. And the very moment Peter confesses to Christ who Christ is, is the very moment that Peter is called into this community. And in fact, he's called right into the heart of Jesus' building projects. The moment he confesses. And I think that was like that for me. I didn't see it coming. I, I honestly thought the church, and I don't mean this in a disrespectful way, I thought the church was about dark, dingy crypts with candles and crosses. I know some people like those. It's okay. You're allowed to. And I, I, I just remember going to church and, and sitting in this crypt in Canterbury it was. And I can remember thinking, this has got nothing to do with me at all. It's so medieval. But in the moment I found Jesus, I got pulled into this thing called the church. I didn't see that coming. I get pulled into this big family. I get called into this cool community. I become one of God's workers. I became your brother. Aren't you glad? You became my... In that moment, I got a new family. The moment I confess Jesus is Lord, boom. I'm in this new thing, this ecclesia. What is this? I'm still asking this question. What is this? <laughs> this thing, ecclesia, the church, is something Jesus is so invested in bringing together. He's so invested in this building project. And Jesus came to do many things, didn't he? But if I understand the message of this book from beginning to end, I think it's been God's central intention from beginning to end. His deep, passionate desire to build a people that know him, that love him, that love one another, and identify who he is. That's the beginning to the end. God wants a people for himself. That's you. That's me. We are the Ecclesia. We are God's people set apart by him for eternity. It's funny how when you become a Christian, the things that you think were really boring become the things you're most excited about. It's like the Bible, isn't it? I say, oh, the Bible is so boring. And then you become a Christian and you're like, whoa, this book. 
And church, I can remember when I became a Christian, I just remember I couldn't wait to get to church. Like, the minute I left church on a Sunday morning, I was counting down the days until I could go back to church. I spent most of my adult life going to church. And I thought it was boring. How does that happen? I digress, I digress. But there's a couple of other things Jesus tells us about this ecclesia. He doesn't tell us a lot in this passage, but he does, he does tell us a couple of things. And the first thing Jesus tells us is that the gates of hell, the gates of Hades actually, will not overcome this new community that he's creating. And it really means the grave. And just like the grave could not overcome Jesus, because he rose from the dead, so the church will be raised from the dead, just like Jesus. The grave itself will not overcome the church. I think that's quite something. The church is Christ's overcoming body on the earth. It's something that is ultimately undefeatable. And it's indestructible. The Roman Empire tried to destroy it. They couldn't. The Herods, remember those guys, they tried to destroy it. They couldn't. Great thinkers and philosophers have tried to disprove it and explain it away. A lot of them became Christians in trying to do so. Wars have come, wars have gone, but the church has only been strengthened through them. And there I say it, pandemics have tried to silence it, but they will not succeed. Because the church of Jesus Christ, the ecclesia of Jesus Christ, is unstoppable. That's the truth. The church of Jesus Christ, people think it's a weak, pathetic little thing that they couldn't care less about. But in the end, the church will be shown to be unstoppable and indestructible. And we will be raised with him into glory. As, su as surely as anything. The other thing the passage tells us, and I'm, gonna, I'm finishing, is that this ecclesia, it is to this ecclesia, this church, that Jesus has entrusted his authority. That's what all this stuff about keys is about. I will give you the keys of the kingdom. God has given his authority to the church. When, when, when Jesus ascended, he says, he came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, therefore go. So when Jesus ascended, where did the authority get given to? To the church, to us. And in that passage, Jesus is no longer addressing Peter when he says, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom. He's addressing the church. Jesus, we know, is seated at the right hand of the Father. His work is done. He said, it's finished. But now is the job of the church through the power of the Holy Spirit to see the work done, the work of the kingdom done, together. And this is the bizarre thing, we can't do the work of God on our own. We need each other. We're part of each other. We're one body, we're one family in fulfilling this commission of doing the things of Christ on the earth. So return to my question, if I'm honest, I don't know what the church of the next few years is going to look like, if I'm really honest. But, what is Harbour Church going to look like? I don't know what it's going to look like, but this, I, I sort of feel like we should be reaching, I hope that we're reaching for something that is dynamic, for something that is creative, for something that is miraculous. Where the miraculous becomes the ordinary. Something that penetrates culture with a message of hope and joy and light in a dark, morally dark, spiritually dark world. I hope that the Harbour Church of the future, that the church of the future, we're, we're going to be reaching for a depth of togetherness. Devotion to each other. The scripture says be devoted to one another. 
That, that isn't just going to church together once a week. It's about living our lives alongside each other. I, I hope they're reaching for something that's counter-cultural. Church without walls. A place of welcome and freshness. Like, that's the type of church I want to be part of. The type of church I aspire to lead. With or without a building. Can I just say that? that we have this great trauma of not having a building. But in the end, the church of Jesus Christ doesn't need a building. It doesn't need a building for us to be God's people. It's nice when we have one. <laughs> but we always say something is the people, but do we really believe it? I, I finished with a little verse that Mark and Joe sent me, which um, really, really spoke to me. And, and I feel this was a word for the Harbour Church, as did they. It was from 1 Corinthians 13. And it says, When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put aside childish things. For now we see indistinctly, as in a mirror, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, as I am fully known. And I think the verse for me, it sort of presents this sort of idea that, like, it's time for the church to grow up. I, I don't mean that in a sort of, like, derogatory way, but to, to not to be focused on what we were, but to look ahead to what God wants us to be. Amen. What he wants us to grow into. Yeah. With God, all things are possible. Yeah. He has a plan, he has a heart for this church. Yeah. And we might not know, we might see through a glass indistinctly, as it says. But God is able to show us more and more of his plan as we go forward. Amen? Amen? So I think, this is my parting little thing, I think we need to get excited about the church. It's God's great idea. It's God's great plan. It's the vehicle through which the kingdom of God comes to earth. And we're part of it. You're part of it. When you confess Jesus, you might not sort of have seen it coming. But you became part of God's building project. You are living stones being built together in Christ. So I'm going to pray. But let me just finish with these. I am honestly finishing. <laughs> Two final little things. Because there might be somebody here, or there might be someone listening at home, that hasn't had that moment of revelation of Christ. And just as we finish with a little bit of worship, maybe it's today that you take that opportunity to confess who he is. It's really simple. Becoming a Christian is really simple. You just confess who Jesus is. And in that moment, your life has changed. Simple confession, followed by life-changing transformation. But also, I'm guessing that there are one or two people, if not here, then watching, that have given up on church. And can I say, if you're, if you're someone who's given up on church, you probably wouldn't be here if you had. <laughs> And no one is judging you if you're someone who's given up on church. Because sometimes church hurts people. Church has hurt me many times. And what you have to learn is to forgive. And forgive. And forgive. And in the end, the joys of being part of God's family far outweigh the difficulties. And so maybe also as we worship... Take a moment to forgive those that have hurt you in church life or disappointed you. And ask God to help you to find your place in the body of Christ again.
I have to do that every so often. We all do, don't we? Forgive. Yeah. Because when we're community, when we're people, and we're mixing together, so at some point someone's going to hurt somebody. Yeah. Which is why we need to forgive. But let me pray, and then I'm going to be quiet. Let's just stand, shall we? Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. I thank you so much, Lord, for each person here, each person listening. I thank you that we are family, Lord. That through our knowledge of you, we've come to be part of this amazing thing. Thank you, Jesus. I just pray for each and every person, Lord, that they would really be enabled to find their place in the body of Christ. Whether in this church or another church, Lord, it doesn't matter. But Lord, we want to find our place. Thank you, Lord. Build us up, Lord. I pray for this church in this coming season. Would you build us up, Lord? Would you lead us into all you have for us, Lord? Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.
thanks for uh, coming, everyone. Um, as you as you sort of uh, just go out, we know there's no rules now about like when you're outside. You can...